just out for a walk with Doggo. And here's an interesting thing. See on the ground here, we've got lots and lots of halves of something. What it actually is, we're underneath a hawthorn tree and these are hawthorn fruits. Well, this is what's left of hawthorn fruits. And these have been eaten by a hawfinch. That is a hawthorn finch. And this is a bird with a specialized beak that eats hawthorn berries. They're not actually berries, they're little poems. And it breaks them open and eats the seed inside. And so actually what we've got here, if we look at these, it's little seeds that are halved and the kernel, the seeds have been eaten from inside of the fruit. They're not interested in the outside of the fruit at all, just the seed inside. Definitely this is evidence that a hawfinch has been feeding on this tree and been doing pretty well I would say. Maybe more than one hawfinch obviously because there's quite a lot of fruits down here that have been opened. I can see another tree up there where the same thing's happened. Here's a brand new thing to be concerned about. I love these little rubber spatulas. They're really great for getting the last bit of jam out of a jar or for getting the last bit of cake batter out of a mixing bowl. But the two-part ones like this, they just accumulate the most awful looking stuff in there. It doesn't matter how diligently you clean that out, it just grows like black mould. I'm just going to get a piece of paper and wipe some of that out of there. I'll show you what we're looking at. So just a bit of kitchen paper towel here wrapped around a chopstick and look at that. And like I say, it doesn't really matter how diligently you clean that out, it just reappears. It just grows in there. That's obviously some kind of mould. And it's not that I've got food in there or anything like that. It's just that it obviously wasn't perfectly dry or something like that. And look at that. Even if I clean that really, really thoroughly and dry it very thoroughly and put that back together, it's almost guaranteed that in a week's time, it'll just be like that again. I don't know if these moulds are actually attracting moisture from the atmosphere once they establish in there, but I'm going to put this in the bin and replace it. And I've replaced it with this. Now, it's not a sponsored segment. They're not paying me to say this is good. I just picked this up at TK Maxx. This was $3.99 and this rubber spatula is seamless. It is actually made of two pieces of plastic, so there's like a stiff inner core that's coated with silicone. So I think we will probably have to watch that this doesn't crack around there over extended use, but that's what I'm going to be using from now on. I'm going to only buy seamless rubber spatulas because I just don't like that that whole thing with the two part hidden grime. So hopefully this one will not do that horrible thing. The saga of non-infinite basil continues. This is the Thai basil that I rooted in one of my previous random videos. These are basil plants that I rooted from cuttings which I bought as cut herbs in a packet from the chiller in Sainsbury's. And I'm sorry to report that it's run to seed. It's just determined to flower. And there doesn't seem to be anything I can do about that. I've cut off several sort of iterations of flower heads and it just produces more. And I think what's going on here is that period of chilling that these plants had while they were in the bag in the chiller there in Sainsbury's has kind of switched them into autumn end of year mode. And that's why they're flowering. They're trying to produce seeds because they think winter is coming. I don't think there's any way to get around that, even though the weather is really warm. It's actually the start of July. The weather's really warm. But I think that period of chilling has just made them decide they're going to flower. I'm not sure whether it's worth growing these on any further because they just seem to be going all leggy and wiry and losing their leaves and focusing on the flowers now. So I don't know. I'll keep them going a couple more weeks and we'll see what happens. I think in the future we'll have to test this with an experiment. I'll get some ordinary basil cuttings. I'll put one lot of them in the fridge and the other lot I'll leave out somewhere warm and we'll root both of them and then we'll see if one lot runs to flower and the other lot doesn't. But for now I think I'm going to say if you want to root cuttings from basil, do it from a live growing plant that hasn't been exposed to low temperature. A few YouTubers that I follow recently made videos where they responded to or reacted to hater comments. And I was discussing this with the good folks over at the Atomic Shrimp Discord. There is an Atomic Shrimp Discord, by the way. Link in the video description. 
But anyway, we were talking about this whole hater comment response thing over there, and they came up with a much better idea. Maybe it might be interesting to do the opposite, where I pick out a bunch of comments that I really enjoyed, or that I found really uplifting or interesting, or questions that were insightful, and respond to those instead, sort of positive reinforcement rather than focusing on the negative. Rather than do a whole video on that, I think we'll just pick out a handful of recent comments that I've noticed that made me laugh or smile or asked an interesting question. So let's have a look. Reading glasses on. Mr. Shrimp, the foraging reference reminds me to ask what the rather attractive and clearly good quality pocket knife is that you often use in the foraging vids. Well, I don't really know all that much about this knife. This is the knife I think you're talking about. And I bought this in a shop in Lyndhurst in the New Forest. All I know about it is it says on one side of the blade, I'll show you some close-ups in a minute, it says Steel 440, which I assume is just a reference to the fact that it's made from stainless steel. However, the Steel 440 is styled as a logo rather than just a sort of identification of the metal. It says copyright designed in Spain. So that's all I know about it. There used to be a link that I could refer people to where they could buy one of these online. Unfortunately, that no longer exists and I can't find this knife anywhere online now. But there it is. Interestingly, this knife is not legal everyday carry in the UK. We've got some fairly strict knife laws, which I'm not interested in debating, by the way. It's not legal carry because the blade is too long for an everyday carry knife. However, when I'm going foraging, I have a good reason to carry it. And so not a problem for me to take that out foraging and use it in a kind of non-public place anyway to cut mushrooms. Stainless steel rather than carbon steel, because a foraging knife, one of the things with a foraging knife is it will often be put away wet. And so stainless steel that can't necessarily take such a good edge as carbon steel is probably better because it doesn't corrode and rust and spoil if it's put away wet. So that's the foraging knife. I'll stop waving that around now. Okay, next comment. First, <laughs> first ha 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 mm. um, So first comments on my channel. I know a lot of people get really annoyed about first comments on the video. So somebody just does this race to be the first comment and first ha ha. I made a conscious decision a little while back to instead of being annoyed by first comments to enjoy them. It's just people who are happy to be here. They are eager to be the first person to comment on a video. It's I don't see any reason to be annoyed by that. In fact, why wouldn't I just love that? And now I really look forward to those first comments on the video. If for no other reason than it confirms that the video went live properly, which is good. So yeah, first comments, I'm not gonna hate them and usually get a heart if you comment first on my video. Next, this is the Wild Strawberries video. It says, I love how the dog looks back at the start of the video, like, oh, he's just talking to himself. Well, just watch that bit. It's not all that often that I come out for a walk looking for something in particular. She absolutely does. I started talking to the camera and the dog, I think, just thought I was talking to her. And so she looks back and I was like, oh, he's doing that again. <laughs> Next one's a comment on one of the Slaughter Valley series. Explosive margarine is the best thing since sliced lead. I really like that, thank you. Uh, next one, oh yeah, next one was a previous random video where I showed a tiny clip of a lizard that I'd filmed in Dorset. And all I did was show this, this clip here, which you're now watching. And the only identifier is that it says it's Dorset. And several people noticed and recognized the location. So here's an example. You filmed a lizard on Portland, Church Oak Cove, if I recognize those steps correctly. That's amazing, it's correct. That is the location and well done. And finally a question, and it's a good question. How do you keep from getting bitten by bugs while in the woods, Mr. Shrimp? Well, sometimes I don't. Um, generally, I just tuck my trousers into my socks if it's winter. Uh, if I'm out there in shorts, the risk of getting bitten, it increases. I do get bitten on my legs a little bit. I tend to avoid going near water at dusk, which is the kind of prime time for mosquitoes and midges and things to bite. I also avoid wading through bracken. Bracken ferns tends to be where ticks hang out. We do have ticks here and we do have Lyme disease. And I have been bitten a few times by ticks, but fortunately never contracted Lyme disease. But yeah, so the main risk I've found for ticks is if you have to wade through kind of waist-high bracken. Ticks, in my experience, won't necessarily just bite you anywhere. So if a tick gets on your leg, it won't always bite you on the shin. They tend to go for the kind of softer parts. And so every time I've been bitten by a tick, it's been kind of just the lower belly or perhaps the, like the soft skin on the inside of the elbow there, places like that. The neck, I mean, obviously the neck is hard for them to get to. 
But so if you're brushing through vegetation, I mean, I suppose if I had to wade through vegetation, I would tuck my shirt in. I don't normally have a tucked in shirt. If I have to go somewhere where there are biting insects, I will use a repellent spray as well. But sometimes even with the best of precautions, you still get bitten and horsefly bites are particularly the worst. They tend to turn nasty and they don't heal very well. The other day, by the way, I saw a giant horsefly. It was nearly the size of a hornet. Fortunately, it was really noisy, so not likely to get bitten by one of those because you'd hear it coming. But uh, horseflies, regular horseflies, are quite quiet and they land on you and you really only feel them just at the end of when they finish biting and at that point the damage is done. And a horsefly bite often doesn't heal very well, takes a long time to heal, sometimes gets a bit infected, gets quite sore and itchy. So horsefly bites are the worst but, you know, it's one of the kind of operational hazards of being outdoors. So I'm thinking of making this segment of answering the positive and constructive and useful and interesting comments a regular little feature in these random videos. I hope you liked it. Let me know if you did. Another day, another unsolicited Amazon package. So this one contains a pack of quercetin soft tabs and Vaseline lip therapy. Both sealed packages apparently in Amazon packaging. This is the third one of these I've had in a month. The third unsolicited package I've had in a month. The first was that chocolate bar that I linked to, but may not actually be linked to, the purchase of that dodgy USB drive, which by the way, cleaned up very nicely with a bit of hot water. And so I've now got a little free aluminium project case that I will use for something Arduino or Raspberry Pi perhaps. It just occurs to me to clarify that that chocolate bar arrived only a few days after the fake USB device, so it can't be either revenge for my YouTube video about it or apology for the fact that they sent me a piece of garbage. However, anyway, the second one arrived earlier this week and the package had split open and the driver actually said, do you, you recognise any of these items? Which one's supposed to be in here? And I said, well, I don't recognize any of those. And I checked my orders. I didn't have anything outstanding. So I turned him away. I said, I don't want that. It's not what I ordered. I'm not expecting a package. And then the third one is this one today, which I have just received this morning. I went through the automated Amazon help and it just very quickly brings you to a conclusion where it says, well, you can keep the package if you want or donate it to charity. We don't need you to return it. But it doesn't ask you for any of the details of the package. It just brushes you off, basically. Speaking of brushing, that's what I think is going on here. That's what I think is most likely happening here, is that somebody has entered my personal details on the address for a separate account, which they're using to buy products to stuff and populate fake feedback using my identity. That's called brushing, by the way. And there's not much you can do about it, really. If you buy something online, you have given people your delivery address details and they can abuse those delivery address details to create a fake account, basically a very mild form of identity theft, and then use your stolen identity to fake feedback and puff up the reputation of another product that you haven't even heard of. There's not really much you can do about it in general, Although, as I say, I did try reporting this to Amazon. I went through the automated bot and it just brushed me off really quickly. So I thought this time I'd go and have a chat with an associate. And after about 20 minutes of chatting and giving them the tracking numbers and everything else, they pointed me to a link where you can actually report the tracking number. And then I think their system will take care of these accounts. It will, it will take action against these accounts. So that's what I did this time. The link for reporting one of those parcels will be in the video description. I actually had trouble finding it, so I'll put it down in the description if you find a need to use that. So on the chocolate bar thing, I chose not to eat that chocolate bar because, as I say, my mum always used to tell me, don't accept sweets from strangers. Interesting feedback I got from that, from a lot of people, actually. A lot of people just said, well, that I would have eaten it. Well, yeah, OK, I'm not you. Um, you do you and I'll do me. I will operate at the risk appetite level that I'm comfortable with and you operate at yours. The interesting thing is some people actually chose to kind of berate me for being so suspicious of something that could that came from Amazon after all and should be reputable because how could you how could you put a poison chocolate bar into an Amazon distribution center uh, which is a fair point it would be very difficult to actually orchestrate a poisoning of a person or or anything like that any any kind of bad behavior it would be actually very difficult to target that via an Amazon distribution center almost impossible i would say but here's the thing our assumptions are sometimes the things that let us down. And the, the assumption in this case is that these things even came from Amazon. How do I know this came from Amazon? It turned up on my doorstep. It was there when I opened the door. 
it wouldn't be that hard to get hold of a cardboard box that looks like Amazon packaging, to seal it in a way that looks like Amazon did it, label it in a way that's consistent with Amazon's labeling, and then put whatever you like in there. I don't think that's very likely at all, but on balance, given that there was no real reason for me to eat that chocolate bar, and a tiny, tiny little reason that maybe I shouldn't, I decided to just err on the side of caution, which seemed sensible to me. Might not seem sensible to you, but like I said, you're not me, I'm not you. Let's all be glad about that. But yeah, I thought the interesting point out of this is that often with scams in general here now, it's our assumptions that let us down. It's the things that we assume are right that are dangerous to us. It's not the things that we look at and understand and fully comprehend that are the problem. It's the things that we kind of just brush off and we say, oh yeah, yeah, that's a package from Amazon, obviously, so that bit's safe. That's probably true. It's probably true. It probably is an Amazon package. But I think it just highlights a kind of blind spot in our thinking processes. And those blind spots are the things that scammers in general attack and victims fall victim to. The one thing that you can take away from nearly all successful scams is that the victim took something at face value. The victim took at face value that it was their bank calling. The victim took at face value that someone they'd never met on the internet had fallen deeply in love with them. The victim took at face value that they'd won the Nigerian lottery. Ridiculous things, but it's the things that people take at face value that they then stop questioning that end up being their downfall. Now, of course, you can't go through your life with zero trust. That's not a happy way to live. However, I think it's good to start from with things that you don't know, a position of less trust, and allow that trust to be built by experience, by evidence, by things like that. Once you've given trust, it's very difficult to take it back. I think my kind of feeling with the whole thing is start from a position of less trust in unknown situations and only build trust if there's a reason to build trust. Anyway, so again, I will not be consuming these, even though I'm 99.999% certain that these are untampered packages, but I'm not going to use them because I have no real reason to want to. The kind of little thrill at getting a freebie is not enough to overcome my tiny suspicion that something might be amiss here. You might not want to operate that way, but that's what I'm going to do. So that's the story so far about unsolicited packages from Amazon. And I think the interesting point is the thing about not accepting things at face value. Anyway, thanks for watching and I hope to see you again soon.